us pray. Jesus, our brother, in the company of your friends on the night before you died, you broke bread, poured wine, washed feet, and celebrated the hope alive in your heart. May the bread we break in the company of our friends nourish the hunger in our hearts for you. May the cup of blessing we drink quench our thirst for justice, love, and peace. The precious blood you shed for your people stains our hearts, our hands, our minds, our lives. Motivated by the memory of your love, may our lives be poured out in loving service of our sisters and brothers. Jesus, our friend, you have brought us near through the blood of your cross. May we be streams of mercy and compassion, reservoirs of reconciliation, harbors of hope. Jesus, our companion, inspire us to be a leaven of your love in our world, in our community, in our families. May there be no strangers among us, only friends, who welcome each other with warmth and hospitality. Seal our hearts with your spirit as we gather in your name. Amen. 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 As thanks for giving out, and I, when they call Brother Tim, I was expecting someone to say he's not here, he's out snipe hunting. <laughs> <laughs> he must have gone snipe hunting, he's no longer here. <laughs> there we'll, so, Brother Tim, were you snipe hunting? Nobody would go with me. <laughs> This is what they do to me when we don't live in the country. Last night they were on me about snipe money. They want me to go out snipe money. So I have to do a Google on that. That comes pretty close to hazing. That's something about tipping cows, too. I don't know. That's going to be my next Google search. <laughs> anyway. Since I was a little, a little boy, I really had a great attraction to the Eucharist. And when I was a kid, I used to, you know, I'd construct a little cardboard altar down in the cellar of our house. And a neighbor later, I commissioned her to make me a pair of or a, like a vestment so I could play mass. <laughs> and then I recruited, with a little bit of force, my younger brother and his friends who would come to our house. They had to be my altar servers. <laughs> I, I never had any success with Lynn on that. <laughs> but uh, mass was always very important for me, and I dreamed of the day when I could celebrate a real mass. Certainly the Eucharist is a central celebration of our faith, as we well know, and it's so important to all of us as a great expression, a synthesis of our spirituality and the blood of Christ. We are a Eucharistic people. We are called to be a Eucharistic people. But the Eucharist sometimes, uh, it can be so used and we can do it so often, and it seems like in sometimes in some cultures, the only way that people know how to celebrate some event is to ask for a mass or a celebration. And so the Eucharist can become, in ministry at times, a little bit uh, of a habit. Uh, we, we have the Eucharist for weekdays, feast days, weddings, baptisms, funerals, and whatever other kind of civic celebration in some countries. And the danger is, the danger is, that we become like little robots, a little wind-up priests celebrating Mass, you know. We don't want to do that. Pope Francis said during the answer that Angelus on the Feast of the Body and Blood of Christ last year, that celebrating and adoring the Eucharist should transform us into people that go out, there's that go out again, to serve and to be in solidarity with others. The Feast of Corpus Christi 
calls us to be converted in faith, to faith in providence, to learn to share the little that we are and that we have, and never to be closed in on ourselves. And never to be closed in on ourselves. In other words, it's not about some kind of just a personal devotion or my personal relationship with Jesus. It's about mission. Communion for mission. So I want to reflect a little bit this morning uh, uh, in this last reflection on the Eucharist because it's so important in our lives and it's such an important, essential part of our of the of the spirituality of the blood of Christ. When a priest is ordained in the ordained ministry, the bishop, when he presents the priest with the Catherine and the host and the chalice with the wine. He says, receive the offerings of the people of God for the Eucharistic sacrifice. Be mindful of that which you do. Imitate that which you celebrate. Conform your life to the mystery of the cross of Christ the Lord. That has always struck me and I often remember that when we talk about Eucharist. We are a priestly people. And so we can apply those same words to all of us when we speak about the Eucharist. We are to become that which we celebrate. There's a great challenge that lies in those words, to become that which we celebrate. Do this in memory of me. And I think so many times we, many, many Christians or Catholics might think that to do this in memory of me is simply like, well, say Mass. Huh? Celebrate the ritual. Well, if that if that happened, that was, I don't. That was probably not even anywhere near it as mine. Do this in memory of me. It was the night before he died. He knew what was coming, what was going to happen. Things were really rough, and they were looking for him to kill him. Judas went out to to, to betray him. He took the bread and gave it to his disciples and broke it. This is my body which is given for you. And then the cup, this is my blood which is going to be shed for you. Jesus affirmed at that moment of his life, when he was coming to the end of his earthly life, he affirmed all that he had done. This has been my life. My body broken. My blood poured out for the life of all. Do this in memory of me. And when they shared that bread and took that wine, they were sharing in this life event of Jesus Christ. They were, they were sharing in the fact that now we are also to be body broken and blood and life poured out for all. Do this in memory of me. Living the whole Eucharist is what I call this, this reflection. Because I think many times we stay in just part of the Eucharist. Many times in our, in our celebrations we don't get to the second part. Or many people, many, many Catholics, don't get the second part. It's about celebrating a ritual or celebrating the memory of something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's fulfilling an obligation. Um, I'm not going crazy, this is fly it. <laughs> Those snipes were really got me. <laughs> but we are called to become what we celebrate. And I don't, I don't think we, uh, many of our, of our Christian people, we don't get that. We stay with the mystery. And in recent years, you know, we, I think this has become such an emphasis on, in some quarters that the Eucharist is mystery, and it is mystery. It is the mystery about how uh, God has been incarnate in Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done to save us. There is a mystery there, the incarnation. But if we just celebrate mystery, we're not celebrating the whole Eucharist. We can't stop there. In the early church, you know, we know how Jesus condemned empty ritualism. 
celebrations and, and rituals which uh, then did not transfer over to as uh, uh, seeking justice or the welfare of other people. The first letter to the Corinthians says, therefore, what? whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the blood of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Without discerning the body. Not talking about the body of Christ in the host. He's talking about without discerning the body, the living body of Christ. So if we celebrate the Eucharist without discerning the body, without being concerned about other people, then we are not worthily celebrating the Eucharist. Paul was upset with the Corinthians, with the Christians of Corinthians, the way they were celebrating the Eucharist. And he tells us that to be true to the full tradition of the Eucharist, we need to recognize the body of our brothers and sisters. If we ignore the body, we are receiving communion unworthily. We are divorcing it from the rest of our lives. Now when Paul wrote these words, there were no Christian temples. People celebrated in their homes, in house churches. The Eucharist was celebrated in the context of a meal. They were enjoying an agape, an agape together, in memory of Jesus. Christians who gather to celebrate the Eucharist do not do so just to remember or to be devoted to it, but to do the whole thing in memory of Him. The Eucharist has to transform relationships and to become a way of life. Beyond, go beyond the gestures, look at the dispositions, look at our attitudes as we come to the altar. Are we putting on Christ? Are we becoming Christ, body and blood for others? St. Ignatius of Antioch, Antioch, who died a martyr's death in 117, expressed in his letters that he wished to become God's wheat and to become Eucharist. In other words, the goal of the Eucharist is to be transformed into Christ, to be and to do as he did. In this way, Jesus continues the mystery of the Incarnation and how we care for one another. This was from the very beginning of the church, but little by little things began to shift again after the, the, you know, the uh, decree of, Cons of, of Milan by Emperor Constantinople in 3, 313, legitimizing the Christian faith and himself becoming baptized, and so then became the thing to do was to become a Christian because you wanted to be of the same faith as the emperor, if you were smart. And so people began to, the, the church grew, temples began to be built. And we used to say in that mission, the parish mission we used to do in Chile years ago, you know, we are church. But then another thing is, another phrase we had during the week was, you know, we, there used to be, they used to be Christians of gold who celebrated with vessels of clay. But after the Edict of Milan, as the church grew and, and it took on a whole different grandiose God, you know, then little by little too, that commitment was less strong, less convincing, and we, now we celebrate with chalices of gold, but many times with Christians of clay. Over the centuries, other things happened to emphasize once again mystery as the church and counter uh, <coughs> certain um, heresies in the church, emphasizing again that Christ was God. And so, God, you know, Christ became, the Eucharist became something a little bit farther away from us. The altar was pushed back, you know, the separation from the people, the altar rails, and all that. Mystery was once again brought in before emphasizing that Christ was God in the Eucharist to celebrate God's presence among us. 
and little by little it became that separation and we sort of lost the idea that come Eucharist we celebrate in memory of him. St. Thomas of Aquinas in the 13th century says that when all is said and done the goal of the Eucharist is love. Jesus shares love with us so that we can love one another with his love. A well-known song we used to sing in benediction on Holy Thursday, also Panja Lingua, attributed to Aquinas, states that it is all about love and service, growing into that kind of love and death as Jesus loved. We must be transformed into Eucharist. What does it mean for us to become what we celebrate? To be bread that is broken. This is my body offered in sacrifice for you. Again, when I hear these words, I think of the nations of Antioch. When the Christians were imploring the emperor not to execute him, Ignatius wrote a letter in which he said, I wish to be ground by the teeth of the wild beast in order to become an instrument of Christ and bread of life for all. He expressed his very deep love of Jesus Christ to the point of wanting to be immolated for him. All else was in vain. Christ asked Peter, Do you love me more than they? Then feed my sheep. We heard it yesterday again in the song that the, that the chorus sang. That's where the presidency of Peter lies. In the service of charity. If you really love me, then feed my sheep. Be Eucharist for my sheep. Be body broken. Be bloodshed. Let us make our very lives an offering of sacrifice to the Lord for the people we serve. We are priestly people, called to a life of service. When the words of consecration are said, um, you know, if we really think about those words, and, and we are all caught up into the celebration, and as a priestly people, we say, this is my body, broken and given for you. This is my lifeblood, poured out for you. We're not just thinking what Jesus said recently last time. No, we are the living, but we are celebrating. It is here and now. This is happening. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. As we know in, 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 the, in, in the Synoptic Gospels, they have the institution of the Eucharist, but St. John's Gospel doesn't have the institution as such. And in its place, it's the episode of the, how Jesus washed the feet of the disciples during the Last Supper. John wants to give like a theological interpretation of what the Eucharist is all about. And as I said yesterday, it's got wash patient and that's towel, and getting down and washing the feet of the disciples. And Peter, who, Peter being Peter, says, oh, no, 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 Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. If I don't can wash your feet, then you have nothing to do with me. And then Peter, oh, is that impetuous? Oh, then wash me all over. If I, the Master, have done this for you, well, aren't you supposed to do the same? Wash the feet. Jesus humbled himself, obedient to the point of death on the cross, in order to save us. Wash patient in the towel. That's what Eucharist is about. That's what it means to share, to do this in memory of me. This is what Christ's life was about. All summed up in that gesture of getting down and washing the feet of his disciples. And Pope Francis, once again, gives us that beautiful example. Now on two Holy Thursdays in a row, he has gone out, he's 
obviously not going to have any big fancy liturgy in St. Peter's. He, every, I, every year he'll go out somewhere and he's going to wash feet. And when he washed, like I said the other day, he washed the feet of women and men and Muslims to the scandal of some of the old cardinal, courier cardinals. This year he went to a home for disabled people and did the same. He preached very little. When the Pope preaches, his homilies are pretty short. They're to the point, but they're short. He says little, but his actions speak a thousand, worth a thousand words. As he kneels before the people, and with such love washes their feet and kisses their feet, it's not just a ritual. You know it's coming from his heart. That's what Eucharist is all about. That is what priesthood, ordained with the priesthood of the people is all about. We are priests in order to give our lives, break open our lives and to serve others. We might ask ourselves, you know, when we go back home, when we go back to our communities after celebrating the Eucharist, whose feet do we wash? How do we break the bread of our life for others. With whom do we break bread? With whom do we pour out, or for whom do we pour out our lifeblood for others? Those others who all can come knocking at our door and waiting for us to welcome them in. Or how often do we open the door from inside and go out to look for those who are waiting for that bread? And for that wine, hope and salvation, love. When I visited our seminarians in Rome, our Italian seminarians, they would go out a few years ago, they still lived down by the fountain of Trevi, in Crocifer, it was St. Gaspar's Ferry. And one of the seminarians told me about what the, the how they go out like on a Wednesday evening throughout the downtown uh, Rome, and they look out, look for the homeless. And Giuseppe told me the story about one of the people he would always visit, always in a certain church step, there was this, this man that he always saw there. And how one day he took him a pair of pants. He figured he needed some pants. And the homeless man said to Giuseppe as he sat down next to him and was talking with him, he said, here, I brought you some trousers maybe, you know, you could use these. And then the man said to, to Giuseppe, ah, Giuseppe, I don't need those pants. I don't need those trousers. There's a lot of other people who give me trousers. But you give me something that nobody else does. You sit down with me. We talk. I'm a person in your presence. I am somebody. That's breaking the bread with others. That's pouring out life to give others hope and life and the joy of encounter of love. This is the chalice of my blood shed for you and for all. The chalice of course, is a symbol known and beloved by all of us. It symbolized, it symbolized the speaks of the spirituality of the blood. And which is the, what is the, which is the chalice that we offer in the Eucharist when we gather to celebrate? When the priest at the altar prepares the chalice for the Eucharistic table, he mixes wine, water, and wine while saying, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we remember how the divinity of Christ has been mixed with our humanity, so that our humanity might be absorbed in his divinity. The words of Second Vatican Council, the joys and the hopes, the sadness and the anguish of men and women of today, of the poor, and above all of those who suffer, are also the joys and the hopes the sadness and the anguish of the disciples of Christ. For all that is genuinely human has an echo in our heart. We are pilgrims of compassion, that phrase that 
that Joel coined years ago. Pilgrims of Compassion, a beautiful image that speaks of us as missionary peoples who walk as an author, a Russian theologian, Catherine de Hoke, Dr. T. Stranik, one of her books, she says that we walk in pilgrimage into the stony hearts of peoples. And as we journey along those, the, 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 the walkway is stony and some, some kind of sharp edge, and our feet become bloody. And our shoulders are also bloody because we're carrying the sorrows and the pain and the needs of other people. We as compassionate pilgrims are called to walk also and to open our hearts to be that chalice which is filled with so much that we hear, so much that people share with us. We are so privileged. It's really awesome to think of how much people open up to us, how much they share their innermost yearnings and desires and failures and, and, and sins and shortcomings. We take all that into ourselves. We are like, as Winfred Wernberg once said, we are like living chalices, open to receive, open for all those things to be poured into us. And when we come to the Eucharistic table, we pour that into the chalice. We pour all those, the, the, the suffering of the poor, of the lonely, the abandoned, the abused, those who are suffering economic hardship, those who are homeless, those who are without jobs, women and children who are exploited in trafficking, sex trafficking. All that we encounter, all the pain and sorrow we encounter, we pour into the chalice. And that becomes part of that chalice that we offer in the Eucharist. The suffering, the cup of suffering. It gathers in all that brokenness and wounds of our world and of ourselves. Our own brokenness, our own sorrows, the brokenness of our communities, our church, our societies. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, in speaking of the Eucharist, reminds us that the Eucharist commits us to the poor. And it says, to receive in truth the body and blood of Christ given up for us, we must recognize Christ in the poorest, his brethren. This is our Catholic Catechism. To receive the body and blood of Christ, we must recognize Christ in the poorest of the brethren. Mother Teresa of Calcutta once said, in the Eucharist we receive Christ in the form of the bread in our hands, but here, in the slums of Calcutta, we receive Christ in the destroyed life of the sick and dying, and then we also touch Jesus. So that cup that we offer is the charted cup of suffering, but it's not just suffering, it's also the cup of hope. Because as we journey into the hearts of people, there are also successes, there's also joy, there's also hope, and we gather all that together as well. We find, we discover the face of the risen Lord. Tell the disciples, go back and tell them, I go before you into Galilee. I'm out there, I'm there, I'm in life. There are signs of life and, new and resurrection all around us if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. So we have to have eyes to see and ears to hear the cry of the poor, but also those signs of new life and resurrection. Hope in the midst of suffering and difficulties in our life. Love, love is stronger than hate. Life stronger than death. Sin can be conquered. And the powers of evil will not prevail. We discover that. We see that. And people who live faithfully their commitment to one another. Faithful to their vows. People who put pro people be others before programs. People who live lives of generous donation, self-donation to others. We discover signs of new life in the reign of God's reign in the solidarity of the people who share their lives with the poor and make their calls to the poor their own. 
small victories. We haven't won the, the final battle, but we, we win small victories. And we have to be able to celebrate that. I used to ask myself, especially in, when I was in Guatemala and there was so much violence, so much suffering, I used to ask myself, how do people maintain hope? Sometimes in a desperate situation. Where humanly speaking, you look and you say, oh my, is there a way out of this? Will things ever change? We are compassionate pilgrims. We are also compassionate pilgrims who share that suffering, but also want to be a sign of hope for people. We have a walk in solidarity, not to be dragged down into desperation, but to somehow, with our presence there, be a sign of hope. Little victories. I remember when we were suffering uh, after the military coup in, in Santiago, there was a time, you know, a lot of men disappeared, um, either they died or they fled, or were put into prison, and so many young women had to raise children, and they didn't have any jobs, and they were struggling how to feed their children. So in the Christian-based community, we got together and said, what can we do about this? And it was a Christian-based community. They, they weren't rich people. But they said, well, we can go door to door and ask for food donations. And we gathered the, the mothers of the children together. And we said, you know, how can we do this together? What can we all do to, to solve this problem? And so one day, I remember one young mother raised her hand and said, well, Father, I could, I could donate a... Uh, a little package of tea, and another lady, well, I could bring a cup of sugar, and another, well, I could bring a half a kilo of, of uh, fideos, or pasta, and so forth. And then the Christian community said, well, we can go from door to door and ask for donations, foodstuffs, and then I, my job was every day, for, for years, I would go out to the supermarkets, in the neighborhood and bake for the leftover vegetables or, or lettuce. I go to the um, meat places and ask if they had any bones or that we might be able to use with a little bit of meat on to make some soup or something. But we did this for two years. And for two years, we fed 40 children a hot meal every day. And it was through the solidarity of working together. It was a living example of what the gospel says when Jesus said, well, disciples, I, I want to give food to these 5,000 people. And they go up and say, well, there's a, all we have is a little boy here has, what, two, two fish or something? But that was enough. The little boy gave what he had. And the miracle of the loaves and the fishes was done. And all ate the bundles. Little victories. They're all around us. Little signs of life of how the resurrected Lord is present. Do this in memory of me. Celebrate the Eucharist. Celebrate the joys. Celebrate the sorrows. Celebrate the, the victories. And all of that is mixed together becomes the precious body of the blood of Christ. <clears throat> and we offer a cup of joy. A cup of happiness. A cup of hope. Which is then given back to us. And we, again, enter into that cup so that our cup can be filled up once again as we go forth to be blood spilled and blood a life poured out for others. The joy. Live the Eucharist. Be Eucharistic peoples and communities. St. Augustine said, speaking of the Eucharist, that we are to be that which we celebrate. We receive the body and the blood of Christ as food for our response to the call to become bread and wine for others. And so when we celebrate the Eucharist and we say our Amen, after the great doxology, we say our Amen. You know, sometimes I, in some countries, um, some of our younger members had become 
so engrossed in the moment of consecration that it's like they're frozen there in time. It's like the consecration is the most important thing in the Eucharist. First, I think that's a deformation. I don't think that's that's not what you perceive. It's not just the door. That, it's that mystery thing. This is the mystery. What happened to the great Amen at the end of the doxology? Isn't that the moment? As they said, there was one author. Oh, I can't find where I have it. But there's one author said that in the ancient church, the Amen of the consecration sounded like thunder. It almost like it almost blew the roof off of the churches. Because at the end of the great Eucharistic prayer, in which you recall all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ, through Him, with Him, in Him, etc., we respond, Amen, so be it. This is the moment. This is the moment. And then when we say our other Amen, when we receive the body and blood of Christ, we're not just saying, Amen, I believe this is Christ sacramentally present in the host of the cup of wine that has been consecrated. We are saying, Amen. I want to be taken up into this mystery. I want to be, Christ invites us to be drawn into this commu deep communion with Him so as to become His body broken and His blood shed for others. That's what it's all about. That's what our Amen means when we celebrate the Eucharist. Amen. Christ's mystery of incarnation, continues in you and in me. That's living the whole Eucharist. You're caught up into the mystery of Christ's incarnation in order to continue giving flesh and blood, flesh and bones to that incarnation in our day's world. We pray today as we celebrate our Eucharist that we also can be caught up into that mystery and also become to say our Amen from all of our hearts. Amen, Lord. Here I am. Take all that I am, all that I have to become your body broken for others, your blood continuing to be poured out so that others might have life and life in the body. life and strength to do Christ's work, to walk in His ways, to speak His truth, to love all people, especially the poor, the suffering, and the oppressed. Do this in memory of me. But we are, but are we ready to walk the way of the cross, to feel the nails of rejection, to thirst for justice, to suffer the fate of the poor? Saints of old knew the cause. Our modern martyrs look into the chalice and see their own reflection. We too must die during Mass if Christ is to live in us. We hear the Lord's command, Eat my body, drink my blood, and we travel. Amen.